And they're back again. We're back. And uh, I've got one for you. That This is actually because, I guess, to the person on the street, all of these uh, things can be connected with just the vague term, the paranormal. I want to ask you uh, f about some paranormal things and perhaps how you feel and your take on what they might be or might not be. Uh, starting with, because I am sort of known for reading stories about them, cryptids. And uh, like Dogman or Bigfoot. Or the Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, you know, uh, the, these, these creatures that people feel they have experiences with them, encounters, but they aren't necessarily documented, I guess. Well, um, obviously these have been in the urban legends for a, a, an awful long time. There's been some proof finding footprints or, or taking photos of the Loch Ness Monster, for example. Um, the earth is full of mysterious things, but for me as a Toltec sorcerer, I find that uh, that's the beginning level. Um, for example, as a sorcerer, you run across things called death defiers. You're able to see inorganics that are feeding off people. You are dealing with realms that mere mortals will never understand. So um, is this a mysterious planet? Absolutely. Well anyone ever be able to solve the whole mystery? I hope not. We ourselves are a complete and total anomaly and a, and a mystery in all of our nuances. But so by that would something say like UFOs maybe have a completely different meaning than what most uh, they might be just spirits or like you say these entities? Well, well I've had a lot of experience with unidentified flying objects and that has been out on wild landscape so we are actually you know recorded them for evidence and we've also recorded on our film allies which are inorganic beings that assist sorcerers we have films of those what they what they say to us in most cases is with the flying saucers they want to reveal themselves to the people they decide to reveal themselves to and there's two categories we've experienced and actually my benefactor Kacharo also had this experience as a young boy on the reservation when one landed that there's the rivet flying saucers we'll call it who are just tourists who are going around to have a good time and then there are the uh, vehicles that are organic they're like bubbles that are, are shifting and they protect the occupant inside who is very fragile if they left that floating cocoon, our breath would send them across the room. Long time ago, and it's actually recent history for us, in the 1990s, the last entities that were caring for this planet vacated the planet. The amount of allies are, are available to assist in the sorcerer now are gone. And that was a very tragic moment when that happened. They gathered together to say goodbye out on the field, and they were manifested, mm, I'm going to call them like small little children, uh, a whole field of small little children in a greenish glow. And they said, we've been assisting you all this time for thousands of years. We're giving up. And they left. They left us alone. So the few allies that the sorcerers had gathered over the years are still under their command, but to find any new ones is no longer possible. No new allies. And now completely changing the topic, we have some questions from uh, episode four where you spoke of filmmakers. Okay. Professor Lorca asks, Thank you for this amazing account. Wasn't there a meeting between Carlos and Fellini? Can you tell us about it? This took place, I believe, in Spain, or it could be Italy, since uh, Fellini obviously was an Italian um, film director. Um, as I mentioned before, people have been influenced by the beginning books 
during the 60s by Carlos Castaneda. Uh, Jim Morrison had the first option, and they were looking at a, a movie star at the time, Anthony Quinn, to play Don Juan Matus. There was a lot of uh, commercial potential in these writings that were bestsellers throughout the world. So it would be natural that uh, underground filmmakers at the time, like George Oreski, um or Fellini, would have a meeting with Carlos Castaneda. Now, it's funny to hear Fellini's rendition of the meeting because prior to them sitting at a table together, the witches came to Fellini's room in a hotel and moved everything around and did mysterious things in his room. Now, he being himself a, a, an intuitive filmmaker, he found that the negotiations were already happening in the abstract, uh, fodder for a really interesting film, right? Uh, so then he went to the meeting. George Oreski became a mystic. He ended up doing card readings in Paris for the last couple of years and trying to find a technique to analyze people. So all of these people are involved with the mystic arts and it would have been a collaboration that would have happened had it not been for Carlos saying one very important thing. He said that, you know, Hollywood filmmakers are not capable of understanding the mystical s situation here. Obviously, Fellini and George Oreski, you two are, but I don't believe that the technical aspects that exist now in the 1970s will do justice to the work. I'll leave that to your interpretation, but oftentimes I see that the ability to show the luminous body, um, you know, some of the um, magic that is real and practical in the Castaneda books would have looked hokey and ridiculous with the special effects they had in the late 60s. Today, would CGI do it? No, again, I've made mention that that would not be acceptable to Carlos. What would be acceptable with both those filmmakers was the fact when they wanted to have a special environment, they would make everything. They would make it out of cardboard. Fellini would make a whole lake out of a, a plastic, black plastic that was being moved to the side and, and cast lights on it to look like a rolling ocean. That would be the direction that a Nawal would pick to make the films today. And All Orange asks you, what about Shaq, the rain god? It depicts Shock. the Shock? Yes. Yeah, okay. Shock. Okay. I don't know these movies. Mm -hmm. It depicts the relationship between the tribe and the shaman living outside the boundaries of the known. Great, great reminding me. Uh, I didn't cover this film. I covered The Matrix and El Topo, but and oh, this is right up there with it. Shock the Rain God came out in 1970. Same time. Was it influenced by Carlos Castaneda? Absolutely. The filmmaker, and this is one of his only films I know of, went to the deepest Maya jungle and used all the local natives to create this masterpiece narrative film about a shaman who was living outside of the tribe, and they go to him as a last resort to get rain. Now, he reluctantly takes them on a journey through the Amazon to gain certain power tools that he needs. It's a very, very beautiful depiction because there is no CGI for the magic. The magic is in the eyes of the indigenous Maya who are not actors, but are intended to create magic on screen. It's a perfect example of organic means to move the assemblage point of the viewer to this day. So that's Shock the Rain God. I won't cover uh, any more of the plot. Hopefully that you'll see it. It is a transmission by a filmmaker that is to this day one of the finest documents of second attention, unknown, and, and capturing magic on film. Shock the Rain God. Cool. Well, we're going to part ways again. This is, we've covered all the questions uh, of people that they've answered. Uh, uh, up to okay. episode four. Absolutely. That's it. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you all for those questions. I find that any clarification we can do is part of moving your assemblage point into greater and greater clarity. And you are the key to this program.